Hey guys, it's Norm from Tested. I'm here on the USS Intrepid. It's a museum, also an aircraft carrier. Here with Eric Bame, you're the curator of aviation. aviation. And behind us, though, we have our buddy, a space shuttle, yeah, the Enterprise. Awesome. That's amazing. It's so much bigger than I possibly imagined. It's and massive. it's beautiful, too. It's gorgeous. There are only four shuttles in existence, exactly. and you guys got one of them. We did, and we got the prototype. And the I was prototype. really, really excited about that. I mean, you know, some people say, hey, Enterprise didn't fly in space, That's but right. you know what? She paved the way for those space vehicles. So her little sister's got to go where she only dreamed. But the Enterprise is just a really important vehicle. Well, I'd love to learn more about the Enterprise, and I'd love to get closer. Well, so let's get closer. Absolutely. All right, Eric, you mentioned earlier that the shuttle Enterprise never went in space. Give me a little bit of the history about you know, when this was built in the 70s and, and what was right. the intention for the Enterprise? Right, well, she was rolled out in uh, 76, and the intention was to kind of prove that something this large can return and land on a runway. Prior to that, our space capsules were crashing through the atmosphere. They had heat shields. Mm -hmm. uh, the parachutes would open up and you know plunk down in the ocean. They didn't have wings. They didn't have wings and they were one-time use. Yeah. So the idea was to, hey, it would be a little cheaper if we could reuse our spacecraft. Not only that, we needed a spacecraft that can carry really large cargo into space. If you look at this thing, it's mostly cargo bag. Yes, that's, that's 60 right. feet long and 15 feet in diameter. So it's all can, empty. And it's completely empty in there, and you can haul a lot of weight up into space. So telescopes, laboratories. Telescopes, uh, parts of space stations, yeah. uh, satellites to be launched, and, and really even government classified cargoes, you know, those spy satellites that the Air Force saying it's launched. Like a Ford F-150. Oh. It is the dump truck Got it. of the space race, right? So, but to get something that large up, it's very expensive. Let's bring it back. To bring it back, you need to fly. And to fly in the atmosphere, you need those wings. So there was a lot of uh, engineering that went into it, a lot of groundbreaking engineering. They had to invent stuff to go to the moon. Well, they had to invent stuff again to fly the space shuttle. Yeah. So a very special vehicle. Here's the prototype. This is the one that kind of proved that we can do it and move forward. So what kind of tests did NASA have to put on Enterprise to make sure that the Columbia and the Challenger could actually work? Well, the first thing, like I said, was that landing phase, coming in with wings. So that's what she was basically designed for. Let's, let's bring her up to altitude on top of a 747, mm -hmm. uh, which by itself was kind of a, a, a big task. Yeah. They had to prove that first. Can we, they had to pick an airplane that could carry it and then bring her up to altitude. Now the 747 was the ideal thing. It, in fact, they used an old airliner. It was a retired uh, American Airlines airliner. So she did five glide tests. And if you notice when you walked in, the tail cone is attached to Enterprise. The first three glide tests, she had that aerodynamic fairing. Now all the shuttles would wear that fairing whenever they had to bring a shuttle back from California back to the launch site in Florida. So the fairings were very important. The last two drop tests that Enterprise took place in, they took the fairing off because they really had to show that she could fly in that configuration that she would be returning to space yep. in. But the fairing we thought was important to leave on Enterprise, mainly because they only built two of them. Uh, and once Endeavor shows up in California, they're going to take the tail cone off. And that second tail cone, who knows where it's going to end up. Might end up in the scrapyard somewhere. So this may very well be the only tail cone from the shuttle program left in existence. So and we're happy to have her. attached to a shuttle and it's a very unique look. Yeah. It's very elegant. I think it is. Kind of sleeks her all out. So functionally, what is different about the Enterprise from the subsequent shuttle? Well, structurally, she was what she was made to be a spacecraft. And even in her name, she is OV-101, Orbital Vehicle 101. Just by the nature of that number, she was meant to go in space. And the thing she's missing, that heat tiles and all the things that keep her from burning up on re-entry. They did not put all that on Enterprise to save money. But she does have replica tiles and all the other uh, thermal protection system is really just simulated on Enterprise. But there is sections of real tile on here and there's a whole other story that goes with those. Oh yeah, what's that? Tell me the story. Well, let's yeah. go right into that yeah. story. Remember the Columbia disaster? Yes. We had a piece of foam break off of the uh, external fuel tank during the launch process and, and the foam came back and struck the vehicle. They weren't sure, of course, we know now that a hole was punched in the vehicle and Columbia upon re-entry it allowed the hot gases to get inside and it destroyed the vehicle with the tragic loss of the crew. They weren't sure how all that happened and uh, Enterprise played a very crucial role. And uh, later on I could show you some parts on Enterprise that actually show the scars of that test. 
So Eric, we're underneath the left wing and the, the landing door, landing gear doors are open. Right. And we see tiles here that look different than the other tiles on, on the Enterprise. Ah, good catch. We talked about the tiles on Enterprise not being that real thing to save money. But, yeah, the foam, know, right? They're, they're, they're that foam. Here you see real tiles and you notice it's very obviously that they're, they're different. They're all individually numbered. These are real tiles. This is really part of that thermal protection system. And the reason they're installed on this one door is because of that Columbia accident mm -hmm. investigation. The tragic loss of the crew. What happened? Did that foam, was a piece of foam this big that breaks off the tank? Is it capable of poking a hole in the wing or somewhere on the structure and cause that kind of catastrophic loss? So what they tried to prove is they took the door off of Enterprise. This exact panel? This exact door. They went to Udvar Hazi. She's mm -hmm. on display. They pull this door off and also these sections of leading edge mm. because the engineers were figuring out based on the film and some of the data, the real data that they had, that there was possibly a strike in this area. Took these pieces down to the wind tunnels at Langley and they simulated the wind, the force of the launch, and they used a compressed air gun to shoot similar sized foam blocks at the door and at the leading edge. And you could see that's the where scars the damage of that test. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people see the damage on these tiles. That is the actual damage from those tests. They actually installed real tiles in this area. There's actually stress gauges still attached. And there's still some engineer tick marks up there and some engineer notes up there. So this is an area that we're not going to repaint that. Yeah. This is a story. As part of the preservation process. Yeah. Right. No. We're going to preserve that too. So Eric, you said you had an astronaut, Mario Runco, here, and you let him inside the space shuttle. Now, he didn't go in the same way he went in when he first... No, flew. no, the crew entry door, we can go in through there. The thing weighs about 350 to 400 pounds. It's very difficult to open and it's very fragile. Uh, I don't like using that door. There's a much easier way to gain access. A secret the entrance. There's a secret entrance to our space shuttle. Oh my gosh, yeah, show me. So it's right here in the uh, right main landing gear well. This is called the well. This is where the wheel folds up into. And if you notice, there's a... A, an open hole up there, you know, it's got bolt holes all yep. the way around it. So there's a panel that bolts over that hole. So when we remove that panel, we actually have instant access to the cargo bay. The huge, massive... 60 feet by yep. 15 feet. Uh, we installed a maintenance catwalk in there. It's just a simple plywood catwalk that we can get in there and walk on that and not damage any of the structure. Stay away from the structure. Mm -hmm. uh, but from the cargo bay, we can actually go in through where the airlock would have been, into the crew module and into the cockpit. And we can also go back and open a panel and go into the engine compartment. And from that, we can open another access panel and crawl into the tail cone. So we actually have through this hole, stem to stern, you know, just access to the whole interior of the vehicle. It's very Mission Impossible. Uh, well, it's, it's really cool, but it's very necessary for the preservation work we have right. coming up. People think of those five drop tests and that was the end of her career. She actually yeah. had a career after that. She went on to go to the Paris Air Show. She was the only shuttle to ever see Europe. So she flew around in Europe, visited Italy, Germany, France, and England on a kind of a, a goodwill tour. And then after that, she uh, was also displayed at the World's Fair in New Orleans in 1984. So she had this little bit of a PR career too. So she was the glamour girl that traveled around. It also floated along the Hudson, right? Oh yeah, but you know, it wasn't her first barge trip either. When I mentioned uh, the World's Fair in, in 1984, they actually took her from Mobile, Alabama to New Orleans by barge. So it wasn't her first time on a barge, but we had a really unique situation. And everybody has seen those great images as Discovery flew into Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. and they flew around Washington, D.C. for like an hour and everybody got their photographs. Did the same thing here in New York. All those iconic images that, that the average American was able to take from either the Jersey Shore or Long Island with uh, the skyline in the background uh, or, or the Empire State Building or the, the Statue of Liberty. It was great. Chills it was, just thinking about it. It was wonderful. Once was just, in a lifetime. And, and NASA really knew how to do that. So, and they did the same thing in LA. They flew up and down the California yep. coast. Right down San Francisco. And it was, uh, I, a friend of mine sent me this really great image over the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. I'm like, man, I love that. So, uh, we flew in the JFK, got her into JFK, and that's where the challenge really started. We had to get her demated from the 747. Mm -hmm. And we had a really interesting challenge. Now we've done this before. We brought our Concorde via barge from JFK, so we knew how to do it. Uh, the challenge with Enterprise is that her tail is very tall, and so if she remained on her landing gear and we simply placed her on the barge, 
the tail was too tall for one causeway bridge. Oh. And there was three bridges we had to negotiate. Uh, one of them was the, uh, uh, the bridge that raises, and there was no problem there. But this one didn't move. So we had to get her down low. What we did is we kept the landing gear folded up, and we made a special provision to keep her on her attachment points. Those same attachment points that attach her to the 747 and also the external fuel mm -hmm. tanks, uh, those same points are what we kept her attached to and just put her on the barge that way. Lowered her by about 10 feet, and we were able to clear the bridge quite easily. Wheels up. Wheels up. So once we got into, uh, uh, past the Statue of Liberty, we got to Bayonne, we pulled into the Weeks Marine Yard down there, and we picked her up again, and lowered the landing gear, and then sat her on her gear. We also attached the forward bipod, because uh, our plan all along was to have her level and 10 feet off the ground. If we just brought her in and, and put her on her wheels, the nose would be so low, actually about three, three and a half feet off the ground, be too low for people to walk underneath. So the bipod right there keeps her 10 feet off the ground and now the visitors can enjoy underneath. So we did that at Bayonne and brought her in and another crane lift put her on the deck. Wow, it's a logistics adventure. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta throw my, uh, my support out to Matt Woods, our vice president of operations, who was in on that planning from beginning to end. And I'm sure he had a lot of sleepless nights and I, I actually noticed a few extra gray hairs on his head now, but he managed to pull that thing off with a really great team from Bay Crane and Weeks Marine. She was put in storage for a little while at Ubar Hazi's uh, center out in Dulles Airport. Uh, but that is when some of the parts were taken for different kinds of tests. She still had a life with NASA. NASA would come out and borrow parts and pieces for testing. Uh, and then after she was even on display at Udvar Hazi, that's when Columbia had happened. That's when they came and took some sections of leading edge and the main landing gear door on this one side off for testing to determine the Columbia thing. So she, she had kind of an active life the whole time she was there. But they didn't dismantle her to, to build Endeavor? Or, no, or no, not at all. You know, they kind of learned lessons with her. Each subsequent shuttle that they made was made lighter. And it was very important to make them as light as possible. Enterprise would have been the heaviest shuttle without anything in her if she went into space, which would have limited her missions. And that's kind of the main reason she wasn't made into a space, a true space vehicle, because she was heavy. But each subsequent shuttle was lightened up. And the lighter you can make the basic airframe, the more stuff you can put in her, and the better orbits you can make. So she looks great on the outside. What did NASA have to do on the inside to make her proper for exhibition? to properly retire her. Well, that's our job, actually. Okay. All right, so, you know, she was kind of considered a, a spare parts locker while the shuttles were still flying. So it wasn't until the shuttles were actually retired last year that Enterprise was retired from being that spare parts locker. Hmm. So now it is our job, and with the guidance from NASA, and we're also working with uh, the Smithsonian Institute, and we're going to be getting inside, and we're going to be preserving the interior. And that's actually getting in there and uh, making sure there's no corrosion. And, and corrosion is kind of a normal process with an aluminum structure. Even the airliners that you probably flew to come to New York have a little bit of corrosion in them that the maintenance guys have to fix every now and then. So we're going to get inside and we're going to preserve. And here's a word. We're going to pickle the inside to make it last for future generations. So how did it come to the Intrepid? What's the tie with the New York and the Intrepid? Oh boy, what a great process that was. You know, a couple of years ago, NASA sent out what they called an RFI, Request for Information. And the letter simply stated, if we retire the shuttles, and if we make them available to museums, how are you gonna do it? And it was everything from, how are you gonna display her? How are you gonna preserve her? How are you gonna interpret her? What kind of educational programs do you have? And more importantly, how are you gonna afford this? Because this is not a cheap endeavor to have here. So, so you wrote an application, it was an essay. Wrote, yes, and it was rather thick and uh, very comprehensive. And uh, there was like 21 other museums that all vied for these things. And, and really, uh, we weren't really sure what was gonna happen to Enterprise. Enterprise was already sitting at Udvar Hazi. So it was really the other three shuttles that were kind of up for grabs. In the back of my mind, I thought, what are they gonna do with Enterprise? Because they've gotta put one of the space vehicles mm -hmm. at Udvar Hazi, that's the national collection. So I kind of thought that to myself, and I, I always thought that, wow, I would love to have Enterprise here. Uh, it's the prototype. Being an airplane nerd that I am, the prototypes are so important to me. You know, you got your workhorses that did the job, but those prototypes, and every airplane had a prototype, yep. and every one of them is important. A lot of those are preserved in museums, so this was important. So I guess NASA and, and uh, Director Bolden at NASA, he, 
kind of liked our, our program that we had built around it. And uh, we just told them what we did, what we do already with what we have here. We just kind of expanded that and the shuttle would just fit right in. And, and, and New York City, what a perfect place. The visitorship we get here, gonna be looking at over a million people coming to see the Enterprise in the first year it's here. You told me this isn't actually the final place for display. Well, no, this flight. is just temporary. So for a few years, we're gonna live here on the flight deck. You're actually on the flight deck of the, of the Intrepid here. And uh, it's an air supported structure. It's uh, essentially an inflatable building. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you noticed when you walked in, you came through an airlock and yeah. maybe your ears popped a little bit. There's a pound and a half or two of pressure uh, greater inside than outside that keeps these walls up. So uh, it's got a double redundant system that keeps it inflated. We've already weathered a couple of big storms. It's worked just fine. So we're very happy in this environment, but we want to get into our permanent home in a few years. Then we can expand the exhibitry around her. And the display is going to be a little different. Possibly? The display is going to be different. I mean, right now, if you walk around in here, you'll notice that there's a lot of graphics and text and videos. There's not a lot of stuff to see. Otherwise, we're going to actually enhance that in a couple of months. We're going to put some display cases in here. We got some really neat artifacts. We got some. I don't want to. I don't want to let out too much out of the bag. But we do have some uh, really early wind tunnel models that show space shuttle concepts don't look like this. You know, the way they were thinking back in the 60s and 70s of what a shuttle might look like. Um, we also have a, a really great connection with Admiral Dick Truly. Admiral Truly flew Enterprise in those test flights. He also was a naval aviator, and he flew from Intrepid in the early 60s. He actually has 100 carrier landings on the exact same spot that Enterprise is sitting on right now. So we actually had, here, had him here on July 19th for our opening, and he was just marveled because here he was standing on the flight deck of the ship he landed on over a hundred times on. underneath the space shuttle that he flew. So he had this great Dick Truly connection and he uh, has actually donated some really interesting personal artifacts that apply to both. So we're gonna put those on display too. And Enterprise, it's so close, it's like 10 feet above the ground. Right. What was the decision to keep it so close to the audience? Well, we're kind of limited here. Uh, the width of the flight deck's about 100 feet. You got about 78 feet of wingspan. So if we kind of cordoned off Enterprise so that you couldn't walk around or we'd have very little space for people and displays mm -hmm. in our temporary home here. So uh, we made the decision to kind of jack her up a little bit and let people underneath. Now, no other space shuttle that's going to be on display will ever have that. And it's great to see people, you see them wandering under with their cameras and they're taking yeah. pictures of details. Works out, I mean, not, not complaining. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. And I've even had people uh, from those other museums saying, this is really cool to do it this way. And every museum is doing it differently. Awesome. Well, this is something you really have to visit to, believe, to see it and enjoy because the pictures and even the video just doesn't do it justice. Yeah, I just love it. Even when you guys came in, you, you, your eyes kind of light up and you kind of get taken aback. Uh, you notice the lighting in here. That was one of the big challenges is to get the lighting right. And uh, the lighting is absolutely perfect. It's almost dramatic. And the dark blue color we chose mm -hmm. for the internal uh, of the structure, it's just, uh, it's just a really cool place to be. I love hanging out here. Yeah. Awesome, well thank you so much, Eric, and uh, this looks amazing. Can't wait to see a couple years down the line the new display. Stay tuned, more and more will be added. Awesome, so from the USC Intrepid, I'm Norm from Tesla, we'll see you guys next time.